Thank you very much, Peter. It's always a pleasure to uh, be at these uh, advanced Austrian seminars at FEE. And uh, I've been giving this talk on the history of Austrian economics for so many years that the, uh, that the history has changed. <laughs> uh, I put a timeline here that will that will indicate see this important year 1954 is unimportant for everybody else it's important for me because that's when I first began to be a student of, of Ludwig von Mises so uh, the Austrian school began in 1871 140 years ago approximately okay uh, I came in I came uh, in contact with it in 1954 uh, not too much after the middle of the of this span, but uh, till uh, the 140 years till today, so that uh, sure the, the the Austrian school has changed. The the history of the Austrian school has changed. It's a, it's a different story than it was when I came in in 1954. Okay, having indicated that, I can erase this because this is not important. Okay, <laughs> uh, but just to give you my perspective on things. Uh, we're going to talk about these different, different periods as I divide them. The uh, first period between 1870 and basically World War I. Uh, following World War I, the period till the early 30s. Uh, then from about the mid-30s on to uh, the early 70s. And then the, period, the modern period since the early uh, 1970s. Uh, this was the initial period, this was the, the founding period, this was, could be called a consolidation period, this was a period of decline, decline and revival, decline and dramatic revival. This is the most, this is the most exciting period for me. In most, in most stories this would be the, kind, the, part, the part that would be left out, because that's the least illustrious period. But I see this, as I'll explain, I see this as the most remarkable period in the history of the Austrian school. And then since the early 70s, we've had the Austrian resurgence uh, that is responsible for your being here today. Uh, when we talk about the, uh, the Austrian school, Austrian school of economic theory, we're talking about the uh, economic theory as an affirmation uh, or denial of the existence of systematic chains of cause and effect in economic affairs. Uh, economic theory has debated that issue. Is there or is there not a special kind of causation, the co economic causation, chains of cause and effect that are not physical, not psychological, uh, but something that we can call uh, economic? Uh, Austrian, the Austrian school certainly uh, answers that question affirmatively. Yes, indeed, there are chains of economic cause and effect, and uh, the history of the Austrian school is a history of how that affirmation has expressed itself in different, uh, in different times uh, during this 140-year period. Let's not forget that uh, there was a background. The world didn't begin in 1871. 1871 was the time when Karl Menger uh, published his Grundsätze, uh, his, what became the Principles of Economics in, in its English version. That was eight, 1871. Before that, the dominant school in economics, uh, both uh, in the United Kingdom and on the continent was the classical school. Classical school of economics uh, and it was in the 1870s that the classical school was gradually replaced by the neoclassical, the neoclassical revolution as it's sometimes called. Neoclassical revolution and the Austrian school as it developed in the, in the 1870s has often been seen as an element in the neoclassical revolution and that's, that's correct. 
Uh, it was an important element in the, uh, uh, the neoclassical revolution. Let me give you, however, a slightly different take on what this meant. I'm going to put a little diagram on the board. that is very simplified but I think is useful in conveying a certain point. I'm going to start out by having resources at the top, consumer, consumers down here. The economic process is a process of translating resources into goods that satisfy consumer preferences and desires. That's the basic meaning of an economic system. Uh, it's, the, uh, it's the social system through which resources become more or less efficiently transformed into goods and services that consumers need, desire, and wish to have. Okay. And now in a market system there are business firms which mediate between the nature given resources and the uh, needs and preferences of consumers. These business firms are the producers. Okay? These are the producers. And this is basically the whole system. Now, the system is very complicated. Many different kinds of resources, many different levels of, of, uh, of, of resources, but and many different levels of production Okay, but you can telescope it all into this highly simplified uh, schematic uh, picture of the economic process. In this process, there are markets. In a market system, there are, there are markets for resources, markets for intermediate resources, markets for, uh, for produced resources, and there are markets for all kinds of consumers' goods. And there are therefore prices, there are market prices. And there are millions of decisions being made in this system. What resources to buy, what resources to, uh, to use, what methods of production to use, what consumer goods to produce. All of these decisions are being made. Consumers are making decisions, business firm producers are making decisions, resource owners are making decisions, and all of the levels that you can imagine here. Millions of decisions being made. But basically, this is what's happening. There are producers who are translating resources into consumer goods, and these, this generates the interaction between all of this, generates uh, sets of decisions and sets of exchanges and sets of prices, market prices. Now, from a physical point of view, there's no question as to what the direction of causation is. If you see ice cream down here, you can imagine a process of production that started with resources and, bring, and finishes up with ice cream. If you see a, a car being used uh, on the highway for recreational purposes, then you can talk about the, the metal resources, the engineering resources, the, uh, the, the, the manufacturing resources that went into the, into the production of all the stages of production that finished up in the, uh, in, in the form of the, of the car that's being used for consumer purposes. Of course, along the road, many other vehicles are being produced. Trucks that bring cars to, to, from Detroit to New York. All, all different kinds of, 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 of <coughs> goods being produced, but these are on the way to the final. The final is, is what the consumer buys. That's the end of the story. It's very important to know there's a beginning and there's an end. There's an end to the story. When you've eaten that ice cream, that's the end of it. <coughs> Right? The economic process is when you bought that car and you're, and you're driving it, that's the end of the process. I, I, I emphasize this because in, in principles texts, there's very often a discussion of a circular flow. The circular flow idea has certain advantages to it. It, it focuses our attention on certain aspects that are useful and valuable, but it misleads. The circular flow gives you the impression that there's an economic process that's, that has no beginning and has no end. And uh, what I'm trying to emphasize here is, yes, there's a beginning and there's an end. There are raw resources from which you start at any given time, 
and that leads up to the satisfaction of consumer, of consumer preferences, and that's the end of it. Now, the direction of causation physically is certainly from the top to the bottom. Menger, Karl Menger, glimpsed a revolutionary perspective. You see, the classical econ economists <coughs> took that direction and they said, well, look, everybody sees that the bread we eat is produced by land and labor, labor digging the soil, plowing the soil, planting the soil, uh, cutting the crop, b b bring, it, bring it to the, to the mill, grinding it, Baking, baking the bread, right? And so that the bread eaten by the consumer it can be shown to come from the earlier levels of resources. And therefore they reasoned very reasonably that, uh, sure, the direction of economic causation is similarly from top to bottom. This came to be called the, the cost of production theory of value. Value, market prices, are determined by the past. The bread that you eat, right, the bread down here has a history. It's that history that determines its value. The history, the cost of production, the physical conditions of production determine what's produced down here. They determine the value of what's produced and this is the whole system. The classical view was a system which saw the direction of economic causation as being from top to bottom. Notice they had no reservations about the meaningfulness of economic causation. The classical economists were economists. They believed, they understood. Yes, there are chains of economic cause and effect, but the direction of that causation was from top to bottom. Menger saw, he glimpsed it. He glimpsed it. He glimpsed a perspective on the economic process which saw things exactly the other way around. The direction of economic causation is from bottom to the top. Now that's a revolutionary concept. It's not merely a demand theory of value, a marginal utility theory of value, as opposed to a cost of production theory of value. It's not merely that. It's much more than that. It's a, it's a recognition that the process that is being described here is a process that starts from, is caused by consumer preferences. Consumers need bread. Consumers want bread. Consumers want ice cream. Consumers want bathing suits. Consumers want cars to, uh, to, to, to drive from, uh, from one place to another. Not, not the business. They want it to enjoy. Those are, those are consumers. If you want a car for business, that's, that's, that's somewhere in the middle here. But consumers want cars for, they want to enjoy the drive. Okay? Because they want these things, this sets up, this sets up a stream of causation which generates production. The only reason why bread is being produced is because the consumers are standing in line for bread. Bread is not being produced because there are, there are, there are uh, wheat fields that can produce bread. Bread is not being produced because there are bakers who stand ready to bake, because there are mills that stand ready to grind flour. The, the uh, bread is produced because consumers want bread. It's because consumers want bread that bakers and bakers feel it's worthwhile for them to bake bread, that millers will feel that it's worthwhile for them to, uh, to grind the wheat into, into flour, and so on. The causation is all goes from down, way up, all the way up. Now, this is a, this, what, this, this as I say was what Menger glimpsed and the beginning of the Austrian school, what we call period A, the, the founding period was based on a, on a one particular application of this perspective, this revolutionary perspective. I'm emphasizing this was only one particular application because the rest of the perspective that Menger glimpsed sort of disappeared for a while. Menger saw it, but it's as if, you know, you're in the, in the, in the, night, uh, in the night, 
a stormy night and the flash of lightning strikes and you, and you see everything. Then the lightning disappears and you forget what you saw except one thing you remember. That's the sort of picture I believe one should get from, uh, from what happened in the Austrian, founding Austrian period. Menger had this glimpse of the, of the causation process, exactly the opposite of what had been dominant before, and this led him to, and this, this generated his book, The Principles, the principles of, of uh, Economics, as it's translated, the Grundsätze, the National Economy. This was a revolutionary book. Hayek has described uh, Menger as saying that when he wrote this book, he wrote it in a fever of excitement. Because he saw that, he saw that he was turning things upside down. And, uh, but but the, the, the sort of the, the tragedy in a way was that although he glimpsed this, the content of Austrian economics in its founding period was only a limited manifestation of this, uh, this vision which he had. The particular part of this vision that was articulated and came to to become the, the main body of Austrian economics in its first 40, or 40 years or so was the subjective theory of value. The subjective theory of value, the marginal utility theory of value, in which it came to be realized that values, prices, market prices are determined not by cost but by utility. That, that, that part of it was, was well understood, was well articulated, the, um, that became the central, the central doctrine of the Austrian school. Notice that this was somewhat different from other neoclassical schools. Other neoclassical schools, particularly Marshall, the, the, the revolutionary character of the marginal utility revolution was, uh, was somehow masked in Marshallian economics. Alfred Marshall the great British economist, he was trying to preserve some of the basic classical economic insights. What he was trying to do was to enrich the classical insights by recognition of the demand side of the market, the marginal utility side. But he still believed that the cost side had an equal, uh, equally important role to play. So that's why we, we in today's economics, what we teach freshmen, uh, we still talk about the supply and demand curve as if these were independent sources of causation for market values. You've got a demand side representing marginal utility, you've got a supply side representing cost of production, and it's the interplay, the interplay of the objective and the subjective, the interplay of the cost and and utility, the interplay of supply and demand that generates market price. That was the Marshallian perspective. It came to dominate uh, what the broader neoclassical schools uh, and is still very much in, in the center of uh, modern microeconomics. The Austrians, all the way from the beginning, uh, recognized that this was a uh, superficial way of understanding the determination of value. Value was determined purely by the demand side. The supply side, the, the conditions of supply were passive background. For the Austrians, they were just passive background. The difference is a philosophical difference. It's a profound philosophical difference, but it's a philosophical difference. Nobody's saying that uh, Marshallian economics will predict a different uh, market value than a, an Austrian uh, theory would. The point is, what is the, the nature of causation? What causes the emergence of market values? For, for the classical economists, it was costs only. For Marshall, it was the interplay of costs and utility. For the Austrians, it was utility only. What about supply? Isn't there such a thing as supply? Isn't there a law of supply and demand? Well, the Austrians uh, saw very profoundly, very subtly, that supply is also the, an expression of demand. If you have to hire workers to produce your ice cream, 
what wages do you have to pay them? You have to pay them wages that are sufficiently high to make it attractive to them not to work in the bakery industry. Right? So that indirectly, the costs you confront in the ice cream industry are nothing but an expression of the utility to consumers of the bread that these people could have been making. This is the alternative cost doctrine. Okay, and that's a profound idea. It, it shows that both the supply curve and the demand curve are ultimately demand. Ultimately demand. In a particular industry, you can talk about supply, you can talk about the, the cost of production determining supply, but those costs of production are nothing else but the the disguised manifestation of the utility of the, which these resources might have been able to produce in alternative industries. So that what is it that determines value here? It's the, it's the, it's the consumer's utility in all its manifestations for ice cream, for bread, for everything. All of, the, all of those preferences are in the mix and they determine the prices that will have to be paid for resources and this determines what resources it will be, it will be useful and, and uh, prudent to bring into production. Whether a person gets up from, from, from sleeping to get to work depends on what is offered. And that depends on the urgency with which consumers want different goods. Okay? Whether they will get up to drive to a bakery industry or will get up to drive to an ice cream industry will depend on the on the different wages that is being offered. Everything depends on, on the consumers. This was the central truth that dominated the first period, the founding period. It was an important truth. I sometimes call it Menger's Law. Menger's Law was that the value of anything is determined by, the, by its value to consumers. The market price of anything is ultimately determined by this value to consumers. I, I sometimes talk about a treasure box, okay? Okay, this is the treasure box. In that box there's a billion dollars. I used to say a million. <laughs> In that box, there's a billion dollars in gold, okay? That box is locked with an impregnable lock for which there's a key. And this is the key, right? That's the key. Right? That's the key to the billion dollars. How much is that key worth? Well, the answer is... It'll, it'll, it, it's, it's as close to a billion dollars as you can imagine. The value of the key, because the key unlocks a billion dollars. If you can only get to the billion dollars by having the key, how much will you bid for the key? You bid a hundred dollars? Sure. With a hundred dollars you can get a billion. Will you bid, if somebody bids a thousand, will you, bid, will you bid two? Sure. If somebody bids a million, will you bid, will you bid two? Why not? Right? And so on, then the, and the competition between consumers will bid up the price until it's as close to a billion dollars you can imagine. What about the cost of production of the key? Irrelevant. Irrelevant. The value of the key is determined by the value of that which can, it can, uh, can unlock. Resources unlock ice cream. Resources unlock bread. Resources unlock bicycles and cars. The resources, the value of the resources is determined by the value of the goods that these resources can produce, not the other way around. That was the basic message of the early Austrians. So it's, but, but, but what Menger glimpsed as I say, he glimpsed it. He glimpsed more than this theory of value. He glimpsed that the, the whole course of causation, the entire structure of chains of cause and effect, were and are determined from bottom up. That's a, that's a more, that's a broader 
wider perspective. And uh, we shall see that the history of Austrian economics uh, consists of the way in which that vision was lost, was, uh, was ignored, and finally came to be rediscovered. I had four periods on the blackboard. Or was it five? I don't remember. Four, I guess. The, consult the, the uh, original period was till about World War I. That was the founding period. That's when you had Karl Menger with his book, his younger, his younger disciples, Eugene von Bambaverk, Friedrich von Wieser. Right? These were not strictly students of his, but they were younger uh, scholars deeply influenced by him. And together, in the 1880s and 1890s, they developed a institutional school, school of thought. You have to understand that that school of thought was very unpopular at the time. On the continent, the Austrian school was dismissed by the, uh, by the German historical school. Uh, they were totally dismissed. Uh, Gustav Schmoller of the German school, he wrote totally uh, with disdain about these Austrians. Uh, there was a bitter Methodenstreit, which is not our it's not the time to go into that. A bitter, bitter fight, bitter doctrinal fight between the Austrians and the Germans. The German school was, was pretty much dominant on the continent. Uh, the British school, as I, as I pointed out, was somewhere in between. The, the, Mar the Marshallians were somewhere in between uh, the, uh, the Classicals and the, and, and the Austrians. Uh, the, Nash, the German uh, historical school was basically denying that there are systematic chains of economic causation. Uh, they would say there are specific matters of causation depending on the particularities, the historical particularities of a particular time and a particular place. But there are no broad theoretical powerful laws that uh, economic theory of course uh, insists do exist. So there was a f extremely bitter controversy between the Austrians and not only the, 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 the British school, not only of course the residue of the classical school, but in particular the German historical school. This was up, up, until, the, the, up until World War I. By World War I, uh, Menge had retired in the early, I think it was 1903. Uh, Bamberg died in 1914. Wieser still continued to teach in Vienna after World War I in, uh, until his death in 1926. So he was, he was still dumb, he was still very active in the po immediate post-World War I period. Uh, when I was once in the early 80s in, in Vienna, I was there on two occasions. One of them, I, 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 found my, I made a very unpopular statement. I said, I'm the only Austrian in this, in the, in this room. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the, but, but what I discovered at that time was that, the, that many of the economists there were deeply influenced by students of Visa. So that they saw Austrian economics as being represented by Visa rather than by Bambaverk or even Menger. Uh, so there's a lot, there was a lot going on uh, in the interwar period. Uh, there was, uh, Wieser was still teaching, uh, Hans Meyer, who was his prime student, uh, took over his chair after, after Wieser's death, and uh, so he perpetuated the influence of, of Wieser. I won't try and articulate the specific differences between Wieser and, say, and uh, but this period between 19... Uh, 18, the end of World War I, until the early 30s, it can be, I describe it as the consolidation period. It was a period in which Austrian economics enjoyed its highest reputation. It was in fact closest to the neoclassical mainstream at that time. That was a period, especially the 1920s. That was the period, the 
you, you, the, the, the most prosperous period for Austrian economics in terms of its academic reputation in the profession. If you were a, an, an American graduate student, you'd want to, and you're making, you're making a tour of the, of the European universities, you want to stop off at Vienna, try and sit in at a seminar. If you were a young faculty member, you'd be, you'd be honored if you were invited to present a paper at an Austrian uh, 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 s seminar in the University of Vienna. Okay, it was, a, it was the most successful period of the Austrian school and as I say it was a period in which Austrian economics came to be seen as a particular form of neoclassical economics. There was a neoclassical revolution, there were different schools of thought and uh, the Austrians were a very important uh, member of that group of, of schools of like-minded economists. Even, even Ludwig von Mises in 1932 endorsed that, that perspective that Austrian economics and other schools of theoretical economics were basically saying the same message except they were using different forms of exposition. More mathematics, less mathematics, this language, that language, this style, that style, but basically the same idea. What he meant by that was that all of the schools had rejected the German historical school. They were all accepting the basic idea that yes, economic theory is a valid body of doctrine uh, that uh, explains the, the reality of, a, of the existence of chains of cause and effect. That was that was indeed uh, the, the reason why and the explanation for uh, the Misesian endorsement of this idea that all the schools of economic thought were basically saying the same thing. They were basically saying the same thing and that yes, there were economic chains of cause and effect. L let me, let me as, as a footnote here, let me explain why it's so important to affirm the existence of economic uh, chain, of chains of economic cause and effect. Since the beginning of economics, you can mark the beginning of economics whenever you want. Since the beginning of economics, the great issue has been government interference in the market system. That's been the basic issue. The, the view which supports the need for and the duty of governments to intervene in economic systems is a simple one. You've got a ball of putty, the economic system, and you want to shape it in a certain direction. You are the government. You have the power to do so. It's your duty to do so. That's the basic perception of the need for and justification for government intervention. What economists from the very beginning taught, and this was, this was revolutionary, was not so fast. This ball of putty is not a ball of putty at all. It's a, it's a, it's a structure which has its own laws. And you'd better, you'd better pay attention to those laws. If you're on the sixth floor of a building, and it's stuffy, and the window is open, so you want to take a walk out of the window to get some fresh air. I would advise you, take note of the law of gravity. <laughs> it's quite true that the, the, the window is open, the air is fresher out there, and it might seem the simple matter to take the step out there. But there are consequences. The putty idea fails to recognize the, the existence of these chains of cause and effect. It fails to recognize the notion of economic law. Maybe not as powerful, as, uh, uh, not as immediate as the law of gravity, but nonetheless as important or more important. Okay? There, are, there are chains of cause and effect. If you do something, this may have effects which you hadn't recognized. You'd better pay attention to that. That's the basic reason why economics has to, uh, has to choose. Do you accept these, the, the notion that there are these 
laws of causation, these chains of cause and effect, which have to be respected, like the law of gravity, or not. So, so, so you, you have to understand that the German school, which was a basically a rejection of economic theory, was a school of thought which uh, was teaching the, the, uh, the ability of the government and the duty of the government to, mm, to modify, to limit, to regulate the economic system. And the economists, all the schools of thought, this is what, what Mises 1932 was saying. Yes, all the schools of thought are united in, rec in recognizing that's wrong. There are cause, chains of cause and effect, which you better, you better understand, you better recognize them, better respect them. So this was, as I say, the most successful period of the in history of, of uh, the Austrian school. During the 1930s, the, there was a remarkable doctrinal change. That doctrinal change was that the Austrian school, from being up there in academic reputability, shot all the way down. That happened during the 1930s. Uh, there, there, there will be many doctoral dissertations uh, devoted to understanding the, uh, uh, the, uh, the events that formed that decline. What is it? What was it? The, uh, there was a there was a Hayek-Keynes debate going on in the early 30s. There was a socialist economic calculation debate going on at the same time. There was a, there was a flourishing of new mathematical methods in economics. There was a flourishing of applied economics, econometrics, in economics. All of that tended to push the Austrians to the margin. There was a capital theory controversy between the Austrians and Frank Knight. Frank Knight, the great Chicago economist, uh, who, whose reputation was enormously impressive, and uh, he dismissed the Austrian capital theory, particularly Hayek, uh, completely out of the picture. And uh, remember, uh, Hayekian capital theory was at the root of his theory of uh, business cycles. So that you had all of these doctrinal battles going on. And the end result of all of these was that by the end of the 30s, the Austrian school was down in the pits. This is why I, I when I marked period C, the period between the early 30s and the late 40s, I marked those, I circled that and I said this is probably the period that uh, most histories of Western economics would like to forget because it was, the, it was the period not just of decline but it was the period of total, total dismissal. Austrian school was, a, was in the dustbin of doctrinal history so to speak. And when I mentioned 1954, the year that I came into, into contact with the Austrian, Austrian school, at that point in time, it had, it had not been recognized that we were no longer in that period. <laughs> at that 1954, the story that I was given, uh, when I told people I was studying under Mises, you're studying under Mises? Uh, Mises hasn't had an idea in, in 20 years. Uh, the Austrian school is dead. Uh, you're uh, embarking on the wrong in the wrong uh, school of thought. Uh, that's old-fashioned and dead. The history of economic thought textbooks that I studied in the 1950s had a respectful chapter on the Austrians up until World War I, and that was it. And then was uh, the footnote somewhere that Mises and Hayek are still alive. <laughs> Something of that effect. <coughs> So these were the last vestiges of a dead school. Dead, buried, maybe, but, but dead. Okay, this was the picture when I came in 1954. But I believe this picture of the Austrian school is, was a total, total misreading of history. 
total misreading of history. In fact, during those years, the years between the early 30s and, say, 1950, those years were years of remarkable, re remarkable, revolutionary innovations in Austrian theory. Mises and Hayek, both in 1948-49, okay, the different publication dates of, uh, of Hayek's, uh, Hayek's uh, 1948-49 book, the, uh, those, those books, Hayek's book of 1948-49 and Mises' Human Action, those books constituted a revolutionary change in Austrian economics. What happened? What happened? Why didn't anybody notice? Well, we mentioned that one of the elements in the, in the history of the 1930s was the debate on Austrian economic calculation. Very briefly, back in 1922, Mises in Vienna had written a book. He had first written a journal article, followed a year or two later by a book in which he maintained that uh, central economic planning, socialist economic planning, was impossible. Impossible. It's not something that, it's not that it's not going to be successful. It's not that it, uh, it's going to be uh, an economic disaster. It just cannot be done, period. The possibility of, of central economic planning is a myth. And the reason why he said that was because planning requires that you know what you're talking about. You know, planning requires that you know what your resources are. Planning requires that you know the alternative uses that the resources have in, in different types of, of utilization. So should you plan your day? Should you go to A first and B later? Should B first or B later? Maybe not go to B, go to C? You know. You've got your, you've got your day. You've got so many hours of the day. You've got the different uses to which you can dispose your time. You've got your valuation of the uses of these times. Therefore, you can make comparisons. What's more important for you? What should you... Is this a waste of your time? Or is this a valuable use of your time? You, you know what the alternative uses of the, time, of, of the time are. In the case of planning for re with resources, it would be necessary for any central planning authority to know the alternative usefulness of resources in different uses. There is no way they can know that, unless it's an extremely small uh, sort of household type plan, which is centrally planned. Unless it's that kind of a scenario, anything a little bit more complicated is just impossible. What permits a business firm to plan is the fact that a business firm is able to utilize market prices for resources. But in a socialist economy, in a centrally planned economy, by definition, there are no resource markets. If there are no resource markets, because there's no private ownership of resources, therefore there are no resource markets. If there are no resource markets, there are no market prices for resources. If there are no market prices for resources, there can be no planning, because you don't know the value of resources and alternative uses. No way in which you can, in which you can plan. It's not, that, it's not that the planners may not be motivated, may not be motivated to, uh, to uh, plan eff effectively. The, uh, the Buchanan, the public choice school, have argued that planning can't work because public officials are motivated by their private uh, benefits and costs rather than by social benefits and costs. That may be true, but that's not the point. The point is that there is no way in which you can plan centrally. I sometimes put it this way. If you see on the, on the, on the floor what looks like a gold ring, and you ask somebody, pick it up for me, please. He may be motivated to pick it up for you and may not. Right? So you can talk about motivation. But supposing what you thought was a ring was really a, a series of gold beads 
placed in a circular pattern and you ask somebody to please pick up that ring it's impossible because there's no ring there is in a socialist society there is no knowledge of the elements necessary to plan there can be no plan this was I won't, this is not a lecture on socialist calculation so, so I won't go, go into any further anyway this was Mises position in the early 20s and that generated a vigorous debate in the late 20s in the, uh, in the German language and in the 1930s in the mainly in the English language and uh, particularly in 1936 there were papers by Oscar Lange and Abba Lerner which seemed to use up-to-date sophisticated microeconomic theory to explain how planning could indeed take place in a socialist economy. There could be quasi-market prices. Okay? There could be prices uh, promulgated by socialist authority, which wouldn't be market prices, but they would be indicators of social value that would be modified uh, by trial and error. And so that at any given time it was maintained, there would be, could be central planning, which could be updated and modified as uh, in, in, the, in the trial and error process. Now, without getting into, into the nitty-gritty of that debate, what I'm trying to explain is that that debate taught Mises and Hayek that Mises' statement in 1932 that there is no difference, no fundamental difference between different schools of thought was dead wrong. It was dead wrong. I can assure you that when I came in 1954, to study under Mises, there was no doubt in Mises' mind that the mainstream of, of economics, not just its macroeconomic version, not just, not just its Keynesian version, but the basic uh, microeconomic price theory of the economic profession was utterly different than the economic theory, uh, market theory, price theory that Mises himself uh, w w believed to be the truth. There's no question about that. What happened? What happened was, in my opinion, that the socialist economic calculation debate convinced Mises and convinced Hayek that they were pursuing, that they, the Austrians, Mises and Hayek, were pursuing a vision which had been missed by the uh, mainstream schools of thought, by the British neoclassical school of thought, but, 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 became basically the dominant microeconomic theory of the, of the mid 20th century. They believed that and the, uh, they set out to articulate what it was that set their economics apart. Hayek, in a remarkable series of papers on knowledge, in the, uh, in the late 30s and early 40s, in a remarkable series of papers, developed his idea that the economic system is a system of dissemination of information. The price system is a system of communication. It's a system by which information possessed in one part of the economic system is transmitted effectively and economically to potential decision makers elsewhere in the system. This is how, um, how Hayek articulated his understanding of the economic system. And this was, this was a, a, a series of, I say, a remarkable series of papers in which this view was, was put forward. It was a view which I think Hayek was articulating tentatively. He was feeling his way to articulating in this way. One of, the, one of those papers was the paper in which he talked about the meaning of competition. Comp and, and what boiled down from these papers is that the major difference between the mainstream neoclassical school and the Mises Hayek school was the focus on equilibrium in the mainstream. The mainstream was treating price theory as equilibrium price theory. That's all it was. Nothing more. Equilibrium price theory. And it was Hayek in his, in his uh, articulation, in his expositions, 
that developed the idea that the market system is a system through which knowledge is communicated and changed. Equilibrium starts out with the assumption that everything that needs to be known is already known. The uh, Hayekian market process theory understands that the process is a process of knowledge communication. This was Hayek. Competition was not the perfect competition of Frank Knight. It was Frank Knight who articulated the, <laughs> the elements of competition, uh, perfect competition, that the textbooks have picked up on. We'll talk about this more this afternoon. Uh, the perfect knowledge uh, assumption, the uniform price assumption, the, the, uh, c the homogeneous commodity assumption, all of those assumptions uh, the, the insignificance of any one participant, all those assumptions are assumptions that Knight put into, uh, into the picture in order to achieve an equilibrium picture of perfect competition. Hayek pointed out that the real world competition, the competition upon which the market process depends, is dynamic, meaning it's the competition that takes, takes place before you've reached equilibrium. That's the, uh, the, that was the Hayekian um, revolution. The, um, the Misesian revolution, these are not identical. The Hay Hayek's articulation was different than Mises. But they both basically, coming from somewhat different directions, they both basically had the same idea as to what it is that makes up the market process. Mises' idea was the entrepreneurial idea. Uh, that's why he called his book Human Action. Human Action is different than constrained maximization. We'll talk more about this this afternoon. Constrained maximization is the unit of analysis in standard microeconomics. The, uh, the microeconomist e micro assumes that the market is made up of, dis of decision makers, each of which has a perfect view of what the state of affairs uh, is, and must, con within those constraints, must try and squeeze out the greatest volume of utility he can get for himself, greatest volume of monetary profit he can get for himself, uh, given, the, given those constraints, constrained maximization. Hayek's notion of the human action, which he, he didn't call his book Human Action by accident. He called his book Human Action because he believed that the difference between human action and the standard uh, decision making is crucial. That difference is the entrepreneurial element in human action. When human beings act, they are not merely choosing from a given set of options that are laid in front of them. They are identifying what those options are. That's the, that's the human action. And that entrepreneurial element is what is completely missing in, uh, in the mainstream, mainstream view. So what happened in the... In the in the 19, uh, in that period between the early 1930s and 1950, was a remarkable change in the basic content of Austrian economics. Now, if history would have stopped there, okay, that would have meant that the history of the Austrian school was basically a development of a subjectivist perspective on value, basically a, a consolidation of that view in line, basically in line with the mainstream neoclassical schools, except that by the end, at the end of the period, just before the, the, they were buried, the Austrians seemed to articulate some new ideas. But what happened was that history didn't stop there. His, history did not stop uh, in, in, in that period, uh, that period C, with a period of decline and, and, and uh, revolutionary revival. What happened was that those books by Hayek and, uh, and, uh, uh, and Mises had a, they took a life of their own. And they did generate interest first by a small number of students and subsequently by a larger and larger number of students. Uh, younger scholars began to discover these new ideas in the Austrian school. And the Austrian school since then has enjoyed a, a, a remarkable resurgence. Uh, as you know, uh, the, in the early 1970s, there was a, a, um, a meeting, a uh, historic meeting in South Royalton. Uh, so South Royalton 
uh, meeting was one in which uh, Murray Rothbard, uh, Ludwig Lachmann, and myself were the, were the lecturers. It was a small group, small, relatively small group of, of uh, scholars there. And I can tell you, it's, it's looking back, it seems remarkable. I was at a meeting planning that, uh, that South Royalton meeting, and there was a discussion what to call it. Should it be identified as Austrian? In other words, the, the, f the foundations that were funding that particular meeting were not at all uh, sold that the Austrian label was a useful label to use. After all, the Austrian label was in the dirt. Why call, why call a, me a conference uh, Austrian if, uh, if that's not necessarily what you, what you want to do and what you want to project? Eventually, for whatever reasons the, the word Austrian was retained, and I believe it was from, from that meeting that gradually the word Austrian came to be, came to be identified with a growing uh, revival of, of the old, the Austri older Austrian ideas as articulated, as enriched by Mises and by Hayek. This was a new perspective on the... Uh, on, the, on the meaning of economics, the nature of economic causation. There have been lots of ups and downs since, since then. Um, the three lecturers, uh, the Rothbard, Lachman, Kersner lecturers at South Royalton had, uh, were, 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 were loggerheads uh, in, many, in, many, in many, res many respects. Uh, Ludwig Lachman and myself, we had a long correspondence over perhaps 30 years in which it took me about 20 years to realize that Lachman and I were on a different wavelength. Uh, we had, we had a, I had a deep, deep respect for Lachman. I still do. He was, he was a dear colleague. But, uh, I, and, and he was a courageous thinker at the time when to identify with Mises was a professional suicide. He stood up and he identified himself with Mises. But he wrote an article from Mises to Shackle which made it very clear that for him, Mises was not the end. Mises was simply a way station to a Shackleian, the, the great British economist George Shackle, who had a vision of economics which was totally different than the Austrians. In fact, by some curious back road, it seemed to lead to the opposite view, that there's no such thing as economic causation. Things get complicated. And Lachman believed that a, a consistent pursuit of Misesian insights would lead one ineluctably towards Shackle. I never accepted that. I believe that uh, the Misesian view uh, was an absolutely sound view. Everything that, uh, that I myself have written uh, on the economic process uh, over the past 50, 60 years is, is, has been, in my view, an articulation of what Mises really meant and to try and demonstrate the, the, the truth and the significance and the importance of, uh, of, of those teachings. So I won't go into some of the nitty-gritty institutional details of the revival. Uh, there have been an, an, many, many uh, younger scholars who have contributed. Uh, I've got a list, uh, Rothbard, Rizzo, O'Driscoll, Garrison, Salerno, uh, David Harper, Steve Horowitz, uh, Pete Betke, Richard Ebeling, Larry White, George Selgin, and others of all, and, 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 and uh, Sandy Akita right here, who have all made important contributions to the revival of Austrian economics. Uh, I'm sure that during this week you'll be uh, encountering more names and uh, insights into the way in which these younger scholars have developed uh, the uh, Hayek Misesian insights into economics. So I'll try and give some of my own ideas on these matters in my uh, lecture this afternoon. Why don't I stop right here? Thank you. Thank you. I'll be very happy to take questions. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I was told that uh, 
Lachman, William Hutt, I think that you yourself uh, were working in South Africa. Uh, what happened in South Africa that uh, it seems like uh, there was uh, something there, I don't know if uh, exactly Austria. Okay, um, I had nothing to do with it. Uh, I, I left South Africa at the age of 18, I, 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 I had nothing to do with economics at that time. Uh, my sister uh, had been a student of, of, uh, of Hutz, Bill Hutz at the University of Cape Town. Uh, she received her degree, uh, Bachelor of Commerce degree I think it was called at that time, uh, at, at the University of Cape Town under Hutt. Uh, but I don't believe she, uh, she was exposed to any Austrian ideas. Hutt was not an Austrian. Hutt was a British uh, London School economist, the London School before Robbins and before Hayek. He, he studied under Cannon, I believe, and uh, Arnold Plant. Uh, so that was Hutt. Hutt was a great scholar. He wrote, he wrote wonderful books, but he was not an Austrian. Lachman had nothing to do with Hutt, as far as I know. Lachman was in Johannesburg, and uh, Hutt was in Cape Town. And although there was only a thousand miles between them, it was like you were on a different continent. So, although it sounds as if there's a, a sort of must be a connection, so after the South African school, uh, that I don't believe that those three names uh, have any connection with each other. Okay. Yes. Can you explain how you came to divert the Rothbard? Uh, what about the Rothbard? How I came to divert, divert from Rothbard? Okay, that's a, I guess it's a longer story that I'm not, I haven't really explored that story, uh, to be quite honest. Um, L Rothbard was a genius. Uh, he directed his genius, I believe, uh, to, uh, to ideological, uh, for, to logical causes for which he believed Austrian economics was important. Okay? I don't believe that uh, Rothbardian economics represents the best interpretation of Mises. A number of issues, I, I disagreed with Rothbard explicitly. On others, I just don't believe that he got to the heart of what Mises want. There are a number of issues where, where there were specific differences. Uh, Rothbard followed Salerno in, in claiming that there was a sharp gulf separating Mises and Hayek. I think that was a tragic mistake. Uh, there's, a, there's a disagreement on that. And, and I'm no doubt people will write doctoral dissertations on that issue too. I think it's a mistake, a tragic mistake for Austrian economics to try and, and drive a wedge between Hayek and Mises. I'm not claiming that Mises and Hayek saw eye to eye on, on everything, fundamental philosophical issues. They did not. They certainly did not. But in one respect, and this is the only important respect, uh, the, 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 is the, the fact that they both understood the market as a process, a process of knowledge discovery. Most of, both of them dis, dis, dis agreed with that. Hayek in 1968 wrote a paper, I believe title, entitled A Competition as a Discovery Procedure. I believe that was the title of the paper. In which I find very little separating him from uh, the Misesian view. Uh, I had the privilege of giving a lecture in Freiburg uh, when Hayek was in the audience and he was kind enough afterwards to get up and make some remarks and his remarks was to the extent to, to the effect that well um, my work has expressed the idea in knowledge in terms of knowledge uh, Kirzner uh, prefers to uh, to interpret uh, the same set of, of uh, features of the economic system in terms of entrepreneurship and that's fine that, that was basically his and I believe that he, he was fundamentally in agreement with Mises on that. Okay, there are other disagreements on monopoly theory that I had with, with Rothbard. Uh, I, I don't want to uh, anyway uh, detract from, from Rothbard's genius and his intellectual courage in endorsing what he understood to be Austrian economics at a time when it was very unpopular in 1962 when he published his Man, Economy, Economy and State. Uh, that was a courageous uh, act to do. Uh, but I still, I can't, I can't agree with his interpretation of Mises. Yes, sir. Uh, what is the role of Schumpeter in uh, the Schumpeter role in the Austrian economy story? Schumpeter, of course, was a student of Bamberg. He he was trained in Vienna. He was, to that extent, more Austrian than anybody else. 
right? He, he and, uh, and Mises were in the same seminar, the, in the Bamberverkian seminar before World War I. Uh, having said that, there is very little in Schumpeter's work that uh, would put him in the same wavelength as Hayek and, uh, and Mises. Uh, it, he, it's true that Schumpeter understood the entrepreneur. His view of the entrepreneur is not mine. Okay, it's a different, there's a difference between my idea of the, of the entrepreneur and Schumpeter's. Uh, but to the extent that Schumpeter did focus on the entrepreneur, to that extent he did not belong in the mainstream of, of uh, 20th century microeconomics. Okay? Uh, otherwise, uh, it, it, there's nothing, nothing beyond that that, that could possibly, <coughs> might possibly identify him as Austrian in, in the doctrinal sense. Uh, with the big arrival of entrepreneurship research and entrepreneurship theory and especially management of business studies now, you have gotten a big mainstream following, but those people tend to ignore the fact that you're Austrian and they tend to ignore free market policy sites and all these implications, or simply pay, pay so they're ignorant of your views on these things. What do you think of your, your work being used in that concept? Okay, I'm not, I mean, I haven't read all of that work, you know, so I, I, I hear from time to time people tell me basically what you're telling me. And uh, to some extent, uh, I say, well, that's great if people have discovered the meaning of entrepreneurship. Uh, I'll be talking this afternoon to some extent more on that. Um, my view of, uh, see, the, the focus in, in, in managerial uh, theory is how do you be a good entrepreneur, okay? You've got these bright young, young college grads who want to become millionaires, excuse me, billionaires, okay? <laughs> okay? They want to become billionaires by becoming entrepreneurs. They've heard that entrepreneurs, entrepreneurship is somehow associated with becoming billionaires. So how do you train people to be, to be entrepreneurs? Now, as it happens, I subscribe to a statement by Will Baumol, that if you can teach it, it's not entrepreneurship. So I don't believe you can teach people to be entrepreneurs. That happens to be my position. But if this focuses attention on entrepreneurship, which I believe to be crucially important for the economic system, I don't know how to be an entrepreneur. Otherwise, it wouldn't be here. Right? <laughs> I don't know how to be a, what makes a good entrepreneur. But I, I do know what entrepreneurship does for the market process. That's, that's the focus of my work, which I understand to be uh, what Mises had in mind, okay? So that's my response to this question. Yes? Uh, what do you make of Peter Klein's recent contention that uh, Mises' view of the entrepreneurship view of Should be what? Should be linked to Frank Knight's view of a capitalist or uncertainty bearer of capitalists? I, I, don't, I don't know to what work you're referring, to be quite honest. I, I'm, 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 I'm not completely in touch with everything that's, that's coming out these days. Um, okay, let me, let me g give you my understanding of Knight and, and to, what ex to what extent that this responds to your question, I don't know. I'll tell you my understanding of Knight. Knight wrote his book, R Risk, Uncertainty and Profit. Okay? This was his doctoral dissertation in 1921. Okay? In the book, he has the body of the book, main body of the book, is on, is on the theory of the perfectly competitive economy. For Knight, that was simply a preface to the final part of the book, which dealt with uncertainty. See? And uncertainty for Knight meant a world in which the future is unknown and unknowable, not able to be grabbed by frequency probability analysis. Okay? That's uncertainty. Knightian uncertainty. Not, not risk, not insurable risk. Uninsurable risk. Knight saw that nothing happens in the, econo in the economic system unless somebody sticks his neck out. <coughs> okay, that's what entrepreneurship means for Knight, sticking, sticking one's neck out. You see, uh, if, if, you're, if you're hired as a professor, you're not sticking your neck out. You know what your salary is going to be, and that you know what you have to do. That's, that's the deal, right? If you're a bricklayer, you know what you're getting, you know what you have to do. That's, you're not sticking your neck out. But the guy who hires you, okay, he's building a building. Does he know he's going to be able to sell it? Okay? Uh, does he know whether, whether the, the, the wage he's offering you is the, best, is the least possible wage he could, he, could, he could offer? He's sticking his neck out. 
Now, that's, that's a Nidian view, and I have no quarrel with that so, so far. The big difference is <coughs> that Knight's view is that when you stick your neck out, mm, there is no tendency whatsoever to make it more likely than not that you're going to be correct in, in, your, in, your, in your action. And I don't believe that that's the truth. Okay, that's a big difference between what I think a, a Knightian view of, of entrepreneurship is and the Misesian view. The Misesian view is that the existence of error invites more accurate entrepreneurial perception. Knight has no, no uh, feel for any such tendency. He made the remark that the likelihood is that in any given period, pure entrepreneurial losses are likely to exceed pure entrepreneurial profits. Okay? That's the big difference. So, um, if, if, if it's argued that Misesian entrepreneurship should be uh, somehow linked to Knightian entrepreneurship, there are senses in which I would uh, agree with that, but I think the more profound senses are that uh, no, that they're not saying the same thing. The, the remarkable fact is that Knight students, the Chicago school of the late 20th century, never read the last part of Knight's book. <laughs> they never read it. I'm convinced they never read it. They, um, talking about Stiegler and Friedman, they, they never read that last part. Impossible that they, must have, they could have read it. Because their economics is economic, and economics are perfect competition. Perfect competition. Equilibrium always. Knight had a much more sensitive and subtle and profound understanding, except that he's left, he's left without any anchor. There's nothing that makes the system sort of systematic, according to him. And I believe that's why they, the, 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 their eyes glazed over if they ever looked at the last part of the book. Yes. Could you speak up, please? I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm sure you're going to hear lectures this week uh, on the part of uh, scholars who are much better equipped than I, than I am to answer, that, answer this question. I believe it's simplistic to say that uh, Keynes won the debate. He certainly won the debate in the 1930s. He lost the debate towards the end of the 20th century. Um, you claim that he won the debate uh, today. I'm not sure on what basis you make that statement. You mean, you mean by winning the debate, it means that public policies have followed his teachings? Is that, yes, that? just looking at the emphasis of the economic profession today and, and how economics is focused in... Uh, okay, I, I, as I say, I, I, don't, I won't necessarily dispute that. I'm not, I'm not convinced that uh, Keynes is back completely, uh, to some extent. Uh, to some extent, the naive Keynesian... Remember, Keynes was giving a veneer of sophistication to what the untutored man in the street was thinking anyway in the 1930s. Okay? So, uh, sure, that untutored, naive man in the street perspective is still alive today. To call that the uh, victory for Keynesian economics is one way of putting it, but I'm, I'm not sure that I would. But I, as I say, it's not my field. That yes. is all the time we have right now for questions. Okay. Dr. I apologize for that. <laughs>